thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Abana Obusubempo. I'm an academic in the law school here at the LSC, and I'm chairing this event along with um, Pierre Montique KC from Garden Court Chambers. Um, so we have an incredible lineup of speakers who over two sessions will be delving into the practice and consequences of criminalizing um, rap music. They'll be providing necessary insight into the criminal justice response to rap and popular culture, but I'm sure also practical information for those who work in the criminal legal system or who create music or support um, people who create music. It's, um, it's been heartening to have such interest in, this, in this, this event and in this topic more broadly. Rap music has been scrutinized and criminalized since its inception some 50 years ago. And for at least the last 20 years in this country, police officers and prosecutors have been using rap music lyrics and videos to construct cases and to present as evidence in criminal trials. Um, I've been researching this topic for about five years now and with a real interest in how the, how the music is getting past the rules of evidence to be presented in the courtroom. And in that time, in the last sort of five, maybe six or seven years even, there's been a big surge in cases involving rap evidence. And that correlates with the rise in popularity of drill music. In, uh, in these cases, the music is almost always used as evidence against young black people. And in ways which we'll be learning more about today, um, not only disregards and undermines the conventions of the music, its artistic merit and the culture of the music, but also perpetuates racist stereotypes, stifles the creativity of young people and ultimately risks miscarriages of justice. As well as using the music as evidence, we see rap being criminalized in other ways. For example, rappers being subject to criminal behavior orders and gang injunctions, which restricts their ability to create, perform or share their music. So it's not surprising that in the past few years, along with an increase in cases, there's also been an increase in concern and pushback against this practice from lawyers, from academics, from artists, from NGOs. Um, a few years ago, Professor Ethna Quinn, who we'll be hearing from, formed the Prosecuting Rap Network, which is a, a network of researchers and expert witnesses who are pushing back against racist police and prosecution narratives in court. Many of those involved in the Prosecuting Rap Network are also part of the Art Not Evidence campaign, which this event has been organized in support of. So the Art Not Evidence campaign launched in November. It was inspired by successful law reform campaigns in the US. Um, it has been founded and is being spearheaded by Ellie Brazil, who is with us today. I don't know if you want to give us a little wave, Ellie. Um, and it consists of a growing group of lawyers, academics, artists, music industry professionals, other campaign organizations, um, NGOs, youth workers, and, and others. And ultimately, we're campaigning for law reform. Law reform to restrict the admissibility of creative expression, including rap music, as evidence in criminal trials, to ensure that it can only be relied on if it is proven to be reliable, if it's truly relevant to an issue in a case, and if it wouldn't be unduly prejudicial. And our proposed legislation, which um, Kira will talk more about the details of uh, at the end of the event, would require that those factors be determined from an appropriate perspective, with knowledge of and respect for the culture and the conventions of the music. So we have drafted legislation which is being supported by Nadia Whittam, who is MP for Nottingham East, and she plans to table our bill um, at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future. It's impossible to say exactly when. Unfortunately, she couldn't join us, but she sent a short video message sort of outlining her, um, her support for the bill. So I'm going to play that now. Oh, I might have to talk to Sorry. Went straight into it. Hi, my name is Nigel Wissom. I'm the Labour MP for Nottingham East, and I'm really proud to be part of the Art Not Evidence campaign. This campaign is about freedom of creative expression. It's about recognising rap as an art form and challenging racist stereotypes. And more than anything, it's about preventing miscarriages of justice and protecting young people, often from disadvantaged backgrounds, from potentially ending up in prison and having their lives ruined for crimes that they did not commit. Like with all music, rap lyrics shouldn't always be taken literally. They often involve metaphors and symbolism, playing with conventions, mixing fact and fiction, 
Many rappers write songs about the reality that they see around them, which can include poverty, drugs, and crime. For many young people, music is a form of self-expression that allows them to find meaning and community, and helps them stay out of trouble. I love rap, a lot of people do. It's one of the best-selling music genres worldwide. As a teenager, we would sometimes rap along to violent lyrics, but like millions of teenagers do. And I'm glad that that was never used against me as evidence in court. And it shouldn't be used to criminalise young black men and boys either. But whether or not you personally enjoy rap or drill, or believe that some of the lyrics are in bad taste or glorify violence, its misuse as evidence in court should concern us all. Because we don't want innocent people to be convicted on the basis of incorrect and often racialised assumptions. And that is why I've decided to join this campaign and to raise this issue in Parliament. So as soon as the slot becomes available, I will be tabling a private men's bill to regulate the ways in which creative expression can be used as evidence in court cases. It's not about saying that songs or music videos can never be used in court. It's about raising the threshold of admissibility so they're only considered when it's relevant, when it's reliable evidence for crime, and where its value is not outweighed by the prejudice it may cause. It's quite a complicated process to take a private member's bill. It will likely take a few months, but as soon as I get the opportunity, that is the legislation that I'm planning to propose. And in the meantime, we need a broad coalition of people to throw their support behind the campaign. So if you want to get involved, please sign up to the website, artsnotevidence.org, and add your name to the list of supporters. So we're really grateful to have Nadia's support. Um, and as she said, we need as much support as we can get. Kira, again, we'll talk a bit more at the end of the event about <laughs> the bill and about how to, to support the campaign. For now, though, um, I want to be able to turn over to our speakers who will be giving much more information and insight into the practices and consequences of prosecuting rap music, what's happening in our courtrooms, and ultimately why we need um, a better approach than, than we currently have. Um, in terms of the order of events, we've got three speakers in each session. They'll speak for up to 15 minutes each, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. And assuming we stick to time, we'll have a coffee break with refreshments and things outside of the room at 5 o'clock. So our first speaker, I'm just going to get your slides up. Our first speaker is Adele Oliver. Adele is author of the book Deeping It, Colonialism, Culture and Criminalization of UK Drill. It's an excellent book. If you haven't read it already, I highly recommend it. Um, the book intervenes on factually inaccurate, dishonest, and unfocused discourse on drill and its apparent link to knife crime and gang violence, redefining drill as a bona fide art form and placing it in its proper context of black art and colonialism. Adele will be speaking to the, the uh, points and themes raised in this book on colonial legacies and the criminalization of UK drill. Okay, okay. Hi, I'm Adele, as Avina said. Um, I'm super excited to be kicking this off. I did say Avina felt a bit set up, to be fair, because I'm the first person. <laughs> but I think it's important because I am, you're going to be hearing some, from some very amazing people today. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be offering you something a little bit different to start off with because I'm not a barrister, I'm not even a criminologist, I'm not even a historian, really. Um, this book that Avina um, mentioned was based on my master's thesis in post-colonial studies, which is a real degree. And um, I've always been based in, in an academic sense in, in language, literatures, and cultures. So that's where I'm coming from, thinking about colonialism, post-colonialism, art, culture, politics, intersections of all of those things. So when I was turning that thesis, which was called Towards a Post-Colonial Music Criminology of UK Drill, which would not sell. Anyway, <laughs> I, the mo one of the most important creative decisions, right, is what you're going to have on the cover. If I was smart, I'd be holding the book. But it, what's, the cover is this, this sign, this gun finger sign, right, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So I'm going to be using this, my cover, and this symbol as a point of departure to explore 
kind of historicize in the best way that I can in 15 minutes the, the colonial and the criminalization of UK drill. Um, okay, so let me start by deepening it because that's what the book's called. So when I was approaching this um, topic and I was thinking about what was happening with UK drill and how much it is part of a much wider story of, of black expression, resistance and criminalization. This is how I, I conceptualized what I think we need to think about to deconstruct what's actually happening beyond just um, what we're doing in, in courtrooms because that's far out of my remit. I'm not in anybody's case see anything. So um, this is a quote from the book. To criminalize drill, you must simplify it completely, strip it of any aesthetic, expressive, or artistic properties, any context or value, keep stripping it down, and you are only left with the brittle bare bones of the concept of crime itself, which breaks easily after a little prodding and poking. So I'm gonna prod and poke a little bit. If you wanna really see prodding and poking, you can read the book. But um, I'll do a little bit. Okay, so Europe's crime concept. The first thing, as I said, you have to get into the concept of crime itself, which I think we, we take for granted as we do a lot of, of, a lot of these concepts that are like huge in institutions that feel immovable. But I, I love this quote from Vivian Silahana, who says, in practice, crime is a concept that limits what can be defined as harmful and violent. Europe's crime concept depends upon institutionalized constructions of dangerousness for colonized people and nations and lack thereof for colonizing people and nations. Now, of course, the binary isn't as simple as colonized and colonizing, but what she's saying here, I think is really important to understand um, when we're looking at the criminalization of drill now. It's not just about violence, because I know we're speaking often about lyrics and the lyrics being violent, but it's, we experience violence all the time that goes unchecked and we don't have a problem with it at all. There has to be some level of threat and danger and notion of harm for that to be criminality. So this is, I, I think of this as like the colonial crime nexus. So you have violence which feels like the defining factor of criminality, but it isn't. It has to have these other two factors which are threat and harm. So in the book, I explore um, blackness as inherent threat. Paul Gilroy talks about blackness as risk and jeopardy um, in the white imagination. So throughout colonialism, for it to work, for in, in the, the broadest sense, conquest and any kind of colonial violence, slavery to happen, which is in a, invariably violent, needs to have um, literal death and destruction is needed. But you need to be able to rationalize that as not criminal. Nothing was illegal during colonialism or slave trade. All of that was within the realm of the law. Um, because there was no threat in that kind of violence from the colonizer because they were actually rectifying the harmfulness of the existence of black violence in the figure of the black slave if you're following me okay so what i'm saying in the book and proposing to you now is that the figure of the drill artist in not just in their lyrics in their existence is at the very crux of this nexus of violence threat and harm so you can have um, one notion of, of the lyrics being violent, but that does not crime make. The threat is inherent in these artists that not only in their speech or their music go against um, the law, but in and of themselves go against the concept of, um, of status quo and what is seen as acceptable. So I'm going to keep going with this gunfingers thing because um, I think it's a really nice way to, to think outside of drill and lyrics being the main issue because um, there's so much more to its criminalization than just what is being said, right? So I'm going to take you back a little bit to the history of the gunfingers to also show you how drill in these practices is linked to these lineages of black expression that go beyond they're just rapping over a beat okay so if, if you you may know this so if you humor me gum fingers and sound systems if you're jamaican in the house no i'm joking <laughs> okay so gum fingers and sound systems if we're going back to the 60s 70s in jamaica um when we had well 
in the book, I'll, in, I'll say this in a more detailed way, but basically in sound systems, you would, you would fire a gun literally when something was popping off. You know, it's good, it's good, I'm loving it. You know, it's like you signal in the same way that you did in colonial times using gun salutes to signal a welcome or a greeting. It was used in a similar way, but repurposed, you know, within the context of joy and excitement. So people have been doing this symbol for a very, very long time. And as we move into the UK, obviously we had grime where this is also happening very often. And it's important to note the collectivity of this expression, right? Which it goes into what Nisha is going to be talking about later, I hope, about joint enterprise. And one of the tr most troubling things about drill and a reason I think why a lot of it is, is tied into this joint enterprise, um, these narratives of joint enterprise so easily is because of the collectivity of the performance. So that was grime. But of course, it didn't just exist in the periphery, it came into pop culture. So I don't know if any of you went to uni in this country, you've seen, oh, mate, this tune, <laughs> all of that. So Gunfingers have become a universal sign of just the song being back. Like, it's just good, it's smashing it up, as Prince Harry is doing right there. I um, don't think he's going to find himself in a courtroom for that. And as we see Adele, not me, the other one, um, with, <laughs> even with much like the cover of the book with black gloves on which is seen as in drill music this admission of guilt right because you're trying to um conceal physically conceal your fingerprints or your identity for using gloves right is is the narrative but as we can see our Tottenham girly Adele <laughs> is also embracing that as a cultural signifier of um something that you can't quite explain so all of this is somatic bodily expression um, that drill continues in the lineage of, um, though it's easier to link that directly to an admission of intent, of violence, because the threat seems more imminent because of the lyrics. Um, but again, when I say you, you have to simplify things and can decontextualize it completely of any of its artistic lineage outside of even what it sounds like, then you can reduce gun fingers to gang signs, as we're going to see later. So I, I wanted to quickly go over how this relates to colonialism in a more explicit legislation way. So um, these are some slave codes from British colonies um, and they show how the, how black expression, so I, I, specifically, I think it's really interesting that the words are never mentioned. It's the drums, horns, loud instruments, dance that were prohibited. So in the Barbados 1688 slave clause, you can see that masters were actually, it was their duty to search slave quarters and burn any instruments that they found, which is not too far from the way that the archive of drill music is, <coughs> is raided at the moment, or has been raided continuously and de facto burned, as some of these, as things are being removed from the internet and of existence really. Um, obviously, in a less, um, there's a, a very nuanced way to discuss that, but it's not such a, a far leap. And in this Jamaica Slave Code, we can see that this nexus and the existence of the, the black slave even having access to music and expression as a threat of rebellion um, and reminiscence of how they were used in war back home in Africa, as, as Hans Sloan, who was a British physicist, reported. And then in South Carolina, similarly, we have this idea of the danger of the collective. Keeping of drums and horns is actually like, it is in the same category as dangerous weapons, right? Because they can call together or give sign or notice to one another, they call each other over the you know, joint enterprise of wicked design and purpose. So um, I'm trying to show you that this idea of music and expression being inherently threatening isn't just coming from lyrics in, in UK courtrooms at the moment, but it's part of a, a really long lineage, complex and um, transatlantic lineage of suppression of, of black expression, which I think drill falls into. So what is the legacy of this? Um, this paper was written in 2018 in the US um, called Imagining Violent Criminals, which is super interesting. 
And I think I came across this through Abner actually uh, when I was first researching drill and criminalization. So the lyrics you see on the screen um, were given to participants. And basically, once they were told, um, they had to, there were three different kinds of experiments. In the first one, when they were told what the genre was, if it was rap, country, or metal, when they thought it was rap music, the character judgment of the songwriter was much more negative than metal and country, with the, the exact same lyrics, literally. Violence, but no threat, no harm, if it's country or, or metal, to a certain degree. And when they were told the race of the songwriter, white or black, there was no difference. So the bias wasn't at the forefront. But when they had to infer the race of the songwriter, whether they were black or white, if they inferred that the songwriter was black, i.e. that it was rap, then they were judged much more negatively. The character of the songwriter was much more negative. The violence of the lyrics feel more threatening because of the person that's saying them, the exact same lyrics. So I think this was a really interesting and actually contemporary example of that legacy of seeing blackness as threat. Um, because literally the lyrics are the same. So it's not really about what's being said, it's about who's saying it. But I want to problematize my own title. I said colonial legacy, but I want to ask if it's a legacy or if it's a living present, which is, I'm stealing this from Christina Sharp. Um, this quote is from a tweet from Roxy the Gan, who you may have heard of, who was... Yeah. Oh, Roxy. <laughs> oh, what's up? Hey. Yo. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I, yeah, this is you. Um, you may not remember this, but I do. Um, and you tweeted, as you were surveying this, um, the Manchester 10 case, which I'm sure you, many of you are aware of, um, that the prosecution kept mentioning this two fingers up expression without any explanation of what it meant and of course that meant gang signs immediately without any of this what I've just explained to you any of that artistic nuance or even cultural um, context given credence so black culture is under attack as Roxy put it and as I would agree so uh, there's a part in my book that I call um, gun fingers and gang signs which is just basically <coughs> So I just wanted to leave you with um, this before you listen to um, the, the next speakers who are going to talk about um, this in a more contemporary way, just so we can, we can have this in mind that the work isn't, isn't just in the courtroom because that, that's like, um, you know, part of it, um, which a lot of us can't do anything about, but there is this other work that exists a lot before that in how we perceive what we give credence to what we respect um and who we value so yeah thank you yeah. <laughs> thank you very much um adele as she said i think that's really important context going into the next talk so we can focus a bit more on um, the ins and outs of what's happening in courtrooms. <coughs> so, oh, are you going next? Oh, okay, so we're switching up the order of things. And we will next hear from Nisha Waller. Um, Nisha is a final year PhD candidate at the University of Oxford. She's also at the, in the Centre for Criminology at the University of Oxford. She's also a researcher at the legal charity Appeal. Uh, her research focuses on racialized processes of prosecution in the context of joint enterprise and she's currently working on a briefing paper with the Center for Crime and Justice Studies on law and prosecution practice in secondary liability slash joint enterprise um, which should be published this summer and she'll be covering some of the content or themes from that in, um, in her talk on the conviction maximizing role of gang narratives and dual music in joint enterprise convictions. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Adele, for really clearly contextualising the issue and historicising it for us. Um, almost a decade ago now, uh, I was an undergraduate student and campaign group Jengba, who are here today, some of them are here today, 
um, came to give a guest lecture at my university and that was the first time I heard of joint enterprise. Uh, for those who don't know, joint enterprise is an umbrella term that's used to describe a set of legal principles that allows more than one person to be convicted of the same offence, even where there's often uh, stark differences between each person's involvement in it. Uh, black people, and in particular young black men and children, are overwhelmingly more likely to be prosecuted uh, under joint enterprise. When um, the Jengba campaigners explained the cases and stories of their sons and loved ones, I remember the other students and me were just, well firstly just shocked, but we couldn't understand, one, how the law could be justified, but two, how juries could convict them. But a couple of years later, in 2017, Someone very close to me was convicted of attempted murder under joint enterprise and sentenced to 31 years, which was a sentence longer um, than the one given to the person said to have carried out the crime. And this was the first time I watched how, firsthand how clever prosecution tactics and case theory can convince a jury that a person that who wasn't even at the crime scene is complicit in the crime. In a joint enterprise case, the person who carries out the crime is known as the principal, um, and the per people who, or person or people who are said to be complicit in the crime but don't carry out the crime are either described as secondary parties, accessories or uh, accomplices and I'll refer to them as secondary parties um, throughout. According to the law, to be prosecuted as a secondary party to an offence, a person has to assist or encourage the offence um, and they have to do so intentionally. But to put it simply, assistance and encouragement isn't properly defined in the law, leaving a really wide scope for prosecution. A person can therefore be convicted of murder for conduct that amounts to no more than their presence at the scene of a crime, so long as that presence is deemed to be supportive in some way. Others have been convicted based on conduct that amounts to no more than a series of phone calls between them and the principal offender or the other co-defendants, um, the content of which that what happened in that phone call or said in that phone call is entirely unknown. Um, and the 2023 uh, Court of Appeal case, R versus Hussein, is a case in a good example of that if anybody is interested. Um, so where is the contribution in complicity? Uh, a young man that I uh, interviewed who was convicted of murder as a secondary party described to me what he was doing when the crime he was convicted of took place. And he said, I was actually sleeping in the car. I smoked my weed, I'm high, I wasn't aware of what was going on. I wasn't the driver. I'm not even in the passenger seat, I'm in the back seat by myself. And so with the law so wide in scope, joint enterprise cases are often propelled forwards based on poor quality circumstantial evidence and where there is no direct evidence of a defendant's contribution to the crime. So how does a prosecutor convince a jury that a person who made no physical contribution to a crime and is so far removed from the offence intentionally assisted or encouraged it? Um, and I sought to answer this question through my PhD research and it happens that rap music, more specifically drill, was central to answering this question. So between 2021 and 2022, I carried out um, lengthy interviews with 41 people. Um, predominantly these were young black men and teenagers who were in prison at the time um, and had been prosecuted or convicted of murder as a secondary party. And many of them had been sentenced to sentences longer than they'd actually been alive. I also interviewed their relatives, as well as barristers, solicitors, and one recently retired Crown Court judge. Um, and so what I ultimately set out to do was to centre the voice of those who are involved in constructing or resisting notions of guilt and collective responsibility in court, as well as those who observe this in action. So that's where included the family members. And their narratives pointed to, mainly to the erroneous and stereotypical use of the narrative of gangs, in the court to construct their collective responsibility for a crime they didn't carry out. Um, and it became clear that the assumption that young black men are gang members and therefore complicit in the actions of one another has become an institutionalised norm. Um, as put by one barrister I interviewed, it's the default assumption when referring to a group of usually young black men to refer to them as a gang, whether or not they are officially affiliated or there's any sort of formal connection. I think it's become a common narrative now to the point where no one questions it. No one thinks, should we actually be charging this? Should we actually be going for murder for all of these people? It's just, it's a gang crime. There's been a death, joint enterprise. Joint enterprise allows us to do this. This is just the way we approach cases. Previous research has also explained racial disproportionality in joint enterprise by reference to um, the disproportionate and uh, discriminatory application of gang evidence and the gang label more generally. 
However, um, the prosecutorial function <coughs> of the gang narrative and the specific mechanisms at play when it's used in court in joint enterprise cases remains uh, underdeveloped. And so uh, the narratives of the people I interviewed and the, their cases drew out four ways that the gang narrative can enhance the prospect of conviction, particularly for a defendant who made very little contribution to the crime. Um, the first is by portraying a criminal character, which is one, one that's fairly obvious. The second is by establishing a contextual backdrop and shared motive for the offence. The third is by assuming shared knowledge between the defendants. And the fourth is by constructing a state of permanent uh, conditional intent or premeditation, which I will explain. So their cases and their narratives um, illustrated how actuating each of these functions can quite significantly rely on the prosecution's use of drill music as evidence of gang membership or affiliation. Um, point one requires quite little explanation, so the gang almost immediately creates an impression of a person who's sort of habitually engaged in harmful or violent group behaviour. Um, and despite violent lyrics and provocation being um, conventional in rap and part of its artistic nature, Several lawyers I interviewed reported experiences where rap was admitted um, into so-called joint enterprise gang cases to demonstrate a defendant's <coughs> propensity for violence. But rap wasn't always admitted through an evidential pathway. In one young man, Shaquille's case, the trial judge uh, accepted that his co-defendant's lyrics, which were written as notes on his phone, were entirely irrelevant to the offence, and therefore they were not allowed in. However, Shaquille reported that the prosecution was granted permission to make the jury aware of the existence of the lyrics, uh, leading the prosecution to refer to rap, including in their closing arguments. Shaquille said, The prosecution said this is just a day in the life of this individual. He's rapping about his experiences. He went on to say, They've done it sly. They could tell the jury we have these bars, but they weren't allowed to tell the jury what we were actually saying. In the closing statement, they basically said, These individuals, they live a life of crime. They write violent lyrics. So for Shaquille, the prosecution's allusion to his involvement in, with rap was integral to their portrayal of him as a violent person. And Shaquille's disclosure is particularly concerning as it demonstrates how drill music and the gang stereotype, which is typically inferred from it, can be introduced by prosecutors even when they are ruled inadmissible. And so by permitting the prosecution to inform the jury of the existence of the rap lyrics, the judge effectively allowed for the prejudicing of uh, the jury against Shaquille and his co-defendant without any uh, discernible justification. And in particular, one thing that I um, took from that was um, that the, the fact that the prosecution still felt compelled to mention um, the lyrics despite their irrelevance um, <coughs> demonstrates the awareness of the conviction maximising capacity of rap amongst prosecutors. Um, and therefore the criminal stereotypes that are associated with it, which they know they can evoke in the jury's mind. Another young man, Casey, similarly described how prosecutors repeatedly questioned his co-defendant about his rap lyrics on the stand, about his rap career, sorry, despite no lyrics or music videos being adduced into evidence. And so I asked, what, what was the prosecution's intention, if not but to prejudice the jury against the defendant by evoking racist stereotypes? To move on to point two, establishing a contextual backdrop and shared motive for the offence. The prosecution um, in a criminal case is not obliged to prove a motive for an offence, uh, but doing so can help to weave a sort of logical thread between the crime and the defendants and thereby influence how juries uh, perceive the defendant's state of mind. And so an example might be um, that a gang is attributed with a history of hostility towards the victim uh, in the case, and the secondary defendants are said to be affiliated with this uh, purported gang. And so these frameworks lend themselves quite easily to notions of revenge or so-called tit-for-tat gang violence, which can signify a common intention to harm the victim irrespective of each defendant's physical conduct in relation to the crime. And once again, lawyers reported that defendants' mere presence in rap music videos, in which the prosecution argue are references of hostility towards uh, a purported gang, is often key evidence used to infer this collective motive. Um, and as put by one lawyer, even a cameo appearance in a music video can become a major plank in the prosecution's case. And this point ties directly into the issue of shared knowledge between the defendants. So by drawing on criminal affiliations between defendants such as that of a gang, the prosecution gains an advantageous foundation upon which to imply that the secondary defendants were aware of the principal's intentions to commit the crime, and this could stand as evidence of the secondary party's intention to assist or encourage the crime. And so while the gang label, the gang narrative is not a prerequisite for inferring knowledge in this way, 
By establishing close associations that are rooted in a criminal enterprise, the gang narrative has a greater ability to infer that a secondary defendant would be aware of the principles prior violent conduct if there was any, or their possession of a weapon if there was any. But the problem here is that the defendant's subjective knowledge is not actually demonstrated. Juries are just invited to assume it. Um, and so ultimately, by constructing a combination of motive and knowledge, the gang narrative begins to provide a, power, a powerful story as to why those who did not physically contribute to the crime intended to assist or encourage it. And so this interplay between motive and knowledge uh, within the gang narrative, which is often constructed through rap evidence, is therefore able to construct a robust prosecution story. The gang narrative ultimately lends credence to the idea that those who made no physical contribution to the, the crime but were present at the scene, purposefully congregated with the principal and the others, well acquainted with their co-defendants characteristics and propensity for violence. And so this leads me to the final uh, prosecutorial function of the gang narrative, which is to establish a permanent state of conditional intent or premeditation. The gang um, in itself indicates an identity that is somewhat consumed by violent conflict, and in particular the sort of popular and mediatised image of the so-called urban gang consumed by territorial foods or so-called postcode wars, um, depicts young people who are always intent on violence should it arise. And so consequently, the gang framework lends, uh, is some, creates a framework somewhat resemblant of conditional intent in cases of spontaneous violence. And by that I mean if a, spontaneous violence break, if a spontaneously violent incident breaks out due to ongoing so-called gang conflicts, gang members are seen to be always acting or ready to act in, in a supportive capacity irrespective of their physical contribution. And the recently retired Crown Court judge that I interviewed gave me the following example. So he said, Gang A and Gang B are armed. It's spontaneous because they bump into each other, but it's planned because they're a little army. They even talk in those terms, don't they, of civilians and all these things. This retired judge then went on to characterise the joint enterprise cases as being carried out through the drill tip for tat world of postcode gangs. So the gang narrative can effectively void any notion of spontaneity, mere presence, or perhaps even self-defence in a violent act. And this was reflected in Shaquille's case, who I mentioned earlier. So Shaquille was charged as a secondary party to murder um, and was convicted by the jury of manslaughter when he was just 17 years old. Uh, he described how the incident at the centre of his case unfolded spontaneously um, and he said it was accepted by the prosecution that he and his friend were confronted by two other young people who had knives at the time um, and in retaliation Shaquille's friend stabbed one of them leading to their, their death. The spontaneity of the incident is likely reflected in the fact that Shaquille was found guilty of, of manslaughter rather than murder. But um, Shaquille described how the prosecution evoked the gang narrative to suggest that the incident was not truly spontaneous. And rather, the prosecution argued that, by, um, that him and his, his co-defendant were uh, purposefully chilling on the block, waiting for or expecting the appearance of their rivals. So we begin to see even beyond music, like the non-criminal actions of young people are criminalised and framed through this lens of gangs. And he, went, he, he described it, he said, that was the prosecution's whole thing, that I woke up one day, I called my friend and I said, let's stay outside, let's chill on the block, bring your knife, let's wait for people to come and let's kill them. That was their whole thing in it, premeditated. For them, that means you're a gang if you're just chilling on the block. That was the way my life was. And so the gang narrative can enhance the prospect of conviction in secondary liability cases, and it does so by offering a frame through which the entirety of a case against a defendant who did not carry out the crime or who made very little contribution to the crime can become more coherent and comprehensible to a jury. And the gang narrative can therefore address weaknesses within the prosecution's case, which, which mostly present themselves because of the vagueness and wide scope of the law that allows them to bring people who didn't do very much into the scope of prosecution to begin with. And rap, which so often accompanies the gang narrative, is therefore, sen therefore central to getting the prosecution closer to conviction in these cases. And to quote Ethna in her recent paper, she says, individuals are prosecuted under secondary liability and conspiracy laws for the most serious offences when there's very little or no forensic evidence against them. And it is in this evidential vacuum that rap's improper use wreaks havoc. And so the risks um, posed by joint enterprise are therefore borne by those who are most likely to be labelled as gang members and those who are most likely to be rappers or associated with rap, and that is, of course, young black uh, male, young black men and, and teenagers. And this perce the perceived um, and unevidenced link, unevidenced link between drill and gangs is now embedded into criminal justice policy. 
And so now when the police see drill, they see gangs, vice versa. Um, police gang intelligence, which is formulated through discriminatory tools like stop and search, shapes gang evidence and prosecution case theory uh, in joint enterprise trials. Black men are, are, are the most likely to be stopped and searched and black communities are over policed. And it was even stated in the recent Casey review that um, every contact that a person has with the police leaves a trace, irrespective of whether a crime has occurred. We've also seen the recent implementation of preemptive online intelligence gathering initiatives, which are criticised for profiling young black men and harvesting data on them on a large scale without any evidence of them having committed a crime. Um, this includes an initiative called Operation Domain, which is described by the Met Police themselves as a catalogue of gang related music. What it really is, is a catalogue of rap music, which can be later used as evidence uh, against the defendant should they be indicted for an offence. Young black men are also more likely to reside in communities that are disproportionately identified by the police as having a gang problem. One young man I interviewed reported that cell site data indicating his time spent on a particular housing estate where his friends lived was used as evidence of his gang affiliation at his trial as the police considered it to be a gang hotspot. So to end, Young black men, even if they're not complicit in the, in the offence, are more likely to enter the police station and the courtroom accompanied by a backdrop of information and so-called gang evidence that could support the inference of guilt simply by virtue of how they are policed. And because of this, it's, it's young black men who make the most ideal defendant for the prosecution in joint enterprise cases are, and are at most at risk of wrongful conviction. And increasingly, the policing and criminalisation of rap is central to this racial injustice in joint enterprise and drill music is, as drill music is used to convince juries that young black men and children who didn't kill anyone are guilty of murder. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Nisha. Um, we now turn to our final speaker for this session, who I think we're picking up on some of those issues around joint enterprise and the use of rap music as well. Uh, professor Ethna Quinn. So, Ethna is Professor of Cultural Studies at the University of Manchester. She has served as a rap, rap expert in criminal cases since 2008. I think the first to do so in this country, potentially. Um, she is also, as I mentioned earlier, the founder of the Prosecuting Rap Network, and she leads on the project Prosecuting Rap, Criminal Justice and UK Black Youth Expressive Culture. She's co-author of the 2022 report, uh, Racial Bias and the Bench, a response to the judicial diversity and inclusion strategy, and al also author of the book, Nothing But a G Thing, The Culture and Commerce of Gangster Rap. So Ethna is going to be presenting some findings from a recent review, which is being published today, um, of cases involving rap music as evidence in criminal trials. Oh, yes, sorry. Sorry, that was me. Uh, Hi, um, I'm delighted to be here. So thanks very much um, to Kia and to Avanal for organising this really important event. And I'm honoured to be on a panel with Adele and with Nisha. So uh, thank you for your papers. Um, this afternoon, yeah, we are able to share a new report, a uh, short report, um, on the use of rap evidence in criminal cases called Compound Injustice, a review of cases involving rap music evidence in England and Wales. Um, despite all the objections to black youth expressive culture being used as criminal evidence, the state has so far, so far offered no meaningful regulation or monitoring so there's a data vacuum in this very deregulated space of criminal justice evidence. Abana Usubempa began to address this profound lack of data with her excellent work analysing appeal cases that involved rap evidence at first trial, work we um, cite in our report. This provides very important data-backed analysis. And now our report adds to this as the first research analysis of data sets um, of Crown prosecution cases involving rap evidence. We wanted to gain a bird's eye view of what the cases were and who was typically involved in them, um, although of course we already um, know. Um, one of my report co-authors, Will Pritchard, led on gathering the evidence. Will was a research associate on this ESRC-funded project 
Once we had gathered this data, he trailed a couple of the headline findings in a press article last year um, as part of um, this project, part of our communication strategy. We then set about looking further into the data uh, with the help of our other co-author, Erica Kane, a University of Leeds researcher uh, currently seconded with the Ministry of Justice. She's a quants expert in criminology at Leeds. And from this data analysis, we've gone on to produce this short academic report. What did we find? I'm going to run through the first four of our key findings and then offer a couple of observations. Uh, just to emphasize first, though, this report is um, exploratory. Um, as we make clear, there are gaps in our data. We certainly didn't capture all cases. We're not making claims, therefore, about scale or representativeness. Fuller data is, of course, needed, and we hope that this work leaves threads for others to pick up and examine. But what we do offer is, does start to give some sense of the scale and key features of this prosecution strategy. In, our three year, in the three-year period we were looking at, we found 68 cases involving rap evidence in which there were just over 250 individuals, 252 uh, precisely. We ended up with five key findings, but I'll just run through these first four. So um, the first one, and this um, leads on perfectly from um, what Nisha was just talking about in, in her extremely important research, um, is joint enterprise. We put that one first. Uh, we, we put it first because we want to highlight the sheer scale of the collective punishment in the cases we found. 80% of the cases were multi-defendant. So group prosecutions, just leaving aside joint enterprise for a moment, 80% were multi-defendant. Group prosecutions are the norm in criminal cases involving rap music. We turn then quickly within this section to the most contentious type of group prosecution, joint enterprise. We found that just over half the cases in the data set were prosecuted as joint enterprise, 53%. Secondary liability rules that Nisha has been explaining in joint enterprise prosecutions are a scandal that campaigners, communities and experts have been exposing for years recently forcing the CPS to conduct a pilot study to gather data on who is being caught in the dragnet of joint enterprise. We wanted to see what kind of role, um, this is their pilot study, we wanted to see what kind of role RAP might be playing, so our definition of joint enterprise cleaved as closely as possible to the criteria used in the CPS pilot it may not be an exact like-for-like -like match in terms of criteria, but we reckon it's pretty close. The average number of um, uh, close for sort of indicative purposes uh, to do comparative analysis. And what we found was that in cases in which there was RAP evidence, the average number charged was notably higher than the overall average found in, by the CPS. So um, our, the average number of defendants in RAP-enabled joint enterprise cases in our data set was 4.7. Um, notably higher than theirs of all joint enterprise cases they found in a six-month period in a kind of snapshot study of all joint enterprise of 3.1 defendants. Um, so that's, that's a lot of people facing the most serious charges in, in terms of that distinction. So our takeaway on joint enterprise um, is there are, these are highly concerning findings that support the view that the marshalling of rap evidence in criminal cases encourages police and prosecutors to further increase the number of, pe of people charged as secondaries under already egregious joint enterprise secondary liability rules. Okay, turning to then to the second finding of four um, was age. These findings in the data set were also very alarming. 82% of all defendants in this data set were children or young people, that's to say under 25 years. In terms of our joint enterprise cases, a child defendant, someone below the age of 18, featured in over a third of the subset. And shockingly, um, in the whole of the cases in our data set, 88% of the children uh, were charged with murder, typically tried in the adult courts, and many dragged into joint enterprise prosecutions under secondary liability rules, again, um, uh, that Nisha was giving us uh, those frameworks for. A very worrying aspect of this is that these percentages of children and young people would be even higher if measured from the time of the alleged offence. Um, 
Sorry, I'm reading off my thing. Very good job. Hang on. Yeah, so we were, we were measuring from the time of the trial. If you measure from the time of the incident, those figures are significantly worse, significantly younger, because it's, for, it's earlier, obviously. And with the backlog in the criminal courts at the moment, that, that time lag can be really significant. Um, so our figures are just from at the time of trial in terms of all those children being caught in this dragnet and young people. So um, our headline then is these findings add weight to those raising the alarm about the overcriminalization, miscriminalization of the young, including children, swept into large joint enterprise prosecutions with rap soundtracks. Third, ethnicity. Um, it comes as probably no surprise that we found that the regular use of rap culture as criminal evidence targets young black men and boys, we already heard. Uh, rap is foundationally a black music form. 84% of defendants in the data set were from ethnic minority backgrounds, 78% were black or, and black mixed. And as we stress in our report, all the scholarly research uh, on the use of rap evidence finds that the use of rap has racist instrumentalities. It's a form of procedural racism. This supports then our headline, widespread concerns that the, la the regular use of rap culture as evidence in serious crime cases unfairly targets black people and is a procedurally racist device. Um, and finally then, moving on to gang labels. These, these persist. Gang narratives were prevalent in our cases. More than two thirds of our joint enterprise cases involving gang narratives uh, uh, had gang narratives. We go into how toxic and racialized gang narrative labels are, as we've heard. With successful legal challenges and with even law enforcement representatives conceding that gang labels overlap so fully with youth culture that they lack credibility. <laughs> Despite, despite the discrediting of the state's gang talk, it is still used to perpetuate state harm, often evidenced, as legal professionals know, by soft inflammatory rap culture evidence. We draw on the excellent research cited on the Erase the Database website, on, on uh, Patrick Williams, Becky Clark's work, uh, and the really exciting work by uh, Nisha Waller, <coughs> the material from Kids of Colour. Um, so, uh, so in terms of just a headline finding there, these findings support those who have identified a powerful nexus between imprecise and discredited, discredited gang labels, improperly evidenced by rap music, and joint enterprise prosecutions that amplify overcharging and mischarging of those in suspect communities. And an interesting finding there is that in the CPS pilot study, they actually found low levels of gang-related prosecutions, which was met with skepticism by some of the um, critical gang experts. And so actually, I think this our evidence does help to show that actually the gang um, narratives are much, much more prevalent than the CPS pilot is uh, uh, found. And actually probably we're already, we're still under-reporting the extent to which gang narratives are used in these cases for various reasons we mentioned in the report. So I just want to end with two observations, uh, one which incorporates comments about our recommendations at this small report's end. Um, the first is a need for case studies, a need for stories. Um, as I've already said, we need data to understand this disturbing practice, but of course there's also a need to accompany the macro analysis with individual stories that can animate and bring home the human cost of these numbers. Um, statistics only come into sharp focus when accompanied by testimony, by stories, by voice, and again, um, uh, Nisha is providing that work um, amongst others. Um, in terms of our report, we offer one such case study um, at the, towards the end, as investigated by um, journalist David Conn. Uh, though it's from a moment before the three-year span of our study, this case crystallises, in, in, in fact, all the key finding trends we found in our report. That's to say, young black male defendants, including children, in a large group prosecution facing the most serious charges in an, in an allegedly gang-related joint enterprise case, heavily assisted by rap evidence. Thinking about um, our title, Compound Injustice, 
This case from Moss Side in Manchester exemplifies the dangerous interfaces, uh, as David Conn suggests, between case variables, which was also, um, which, which was kind of an overall compelling takeaway when you looked at across our database, was the actual interfaces between the different variables in, in accelerating and escalating uh, inferences of risk and danger associated with the defendants. So David Conn has, um, has investigated that. Uh, amongst uh, others. Okay, so um, thinking about, uh, so another detailed <coughs> case study that captures nearly all the trends in our report is my new piece in Race and Class. Um, uh, so does Will Pritchard, he, he, he offers stories as well as some, some stats in that beautiful piece that he wrote last year. Um, and uh, my new piece in, in Race and Class, my article investigates a single joint enterprise case focusing on uh, one um, defendant, a black teenager charged with murder under secondary liability rules, whose rap lyrics were sought to be heavily used as both direct and indirect evidence. Um, so that's a close look at how prosecution discourses play out in these cases in an individual instance. And that case is one of those included in our compound injustice data set. So um, I see our new report and this open access article in the current issue of Race and Class's companion pieces. Um, and I believe there are some free issues uh, up for grabs here today, courtesy of the journal. And Nisha's is in there too, so I, I, our journal uh, is, is there's going to be some copies circulating. So whether we start with the specifics and move outwards or start with a bird's eye view uh, and home in, it's important for us to continue to link up macro and micro as, as people are doing in order to communicate this complex and still underappreciated and underapprehended story of injustice. And I wanted to end with a reflection on our recommendations. I don't propose to read out our reports for legal reform recommendations. They permeate this important event, and they can no doubt be better explained by other authorities presenting today, our lawyers and legal scholars. I wanted instead to surface the tension we tried to capture in our report recommendations and conclusion between, on the one hand, a narrow but absolutely necessary legal and policy reform agenda Getting these bills and proposals through will represent a massive victory. Um, the, the, um, the Criminal Evidence Creative and Artistic Expression Bill, the Joint Enterprise Significant Contribution Private Members Bill, um, and um, that, that really is um, essential. On the other hand, there are even there are bigger picture recommendations that a story of compound injustice like this requires. What emerges is a, is a critical need for tra transformative root cause change amid profound political crisis and social policy failure. So what we ended with um, for our report conclusion was the urgent need for targeted law reform. Um, those two bills, um, also the, imp the important, potentially important work now taking place with CPS on disparities and the, the, the research they're commissioning and what they do with that research, but also not losing sight of the broader context in which a societal reset is so vitally needed the need we also end with, um, therefore, is a shift from carcerality to care of young people and communities, and um, powerfully laid out, as we say in our conclusion, in reports like the multi-organisational uh, Holding Our Own, A Guide to Non-Policing Solutions to Serious Youth Violence. So I'll leave it on that. If you haven't checked it out, do I would recommend reading that report. Okay, thank you. Afternoon. <laughs> audience participation and you're late <laughs> so afternoon afternoon okay. <laughs> good afternoon, good afternoon. Yeah, okay. um, welcome back I've been told um, to be very short uh, which is difficult because I spend my life talking but I'm going to try and be brief because you've already had three excellent speakers. We've got another, where do they come from? Um, three excellent speakers. I know it looks like two, but in actual fact, um, over the next few minutes, it will turn into uh, three, three barristers uh, to educate you about various different topics. Uh, but what I thought I would do in uh, a short space of time is just uh, mention two cases um, that sum up all the terrible stuff 
that you've heard uh, before the break, but give us a little bit of hope. I don't know what's going on in Manchester, but both of these cases come from Manchester, and they make me angry. Uh, the first was 2017, two uh, trials. It was a single uh, murder. Um, two wounds to the ne neck by one individual. So how on earth were 12 young black men prosecuted? When I say men, they weren't men. They were teenagers. Uh, one um, exception was a, a bloke who was 25, 26. In that case, the state prosecuted a 14-year-old. He didn't stab anyone. But they saw fit to prosecute him for murder. And it makes me angry. It's only 2017. It's not in the 70s or the 80s when things were really bad. But I, I say that things are really bad now. So first question is, how on earth could that happen? Twelve people for one stabber. No one else was responsible for those two stab wounds. So you've got to ask yourself, what on earth is going on? Second question in that case is, why were the prosecution allowed to play a rap track in that murder case? What on earth was going on? Well, the judge told the jury. He said to the jury that if, when they're considering a defendant, that defendant participated in that video or even had possession of that video, they could come to the conclusion, I'm not joking about this, that that particular individual was in a gang. And it, and it is worth just thinking that through, that it was said with all seriousness by a high court judge that you could come to that conclusion. That rap track has had 98,000 views. And it's an absolute joke to suggest that if you had listened to it or possessed it, that you could come to a conclusion that someone was in a gang. But in that case, there's been a trial, 11 people convicted, black, and as uh, some wish to be described, mixed race. One single murder, 168 years. And it's worth thinking about the impact on the defendants, their families, and the community. I could go on for ages, but I'm conscious that in fact some other people are here to speak. So I'm going to stop. There's another case I'll Squeeze in at the end if there's sufficient um, time. What you're here uh, to uh, listen to are our expert panel. Uh, the first up is Danielle Manson. And I've got a little bit to read out here, but I'm going to add to it because she's been far too modest about her special powers. Uh, Danielle Manson is a criminal defence barrister who practices primarily in serious crime. She has particular expertise representing children and young people and has appeared as a lead junior and single advocate in cases of murder, attempted murder, rape, serious violence, fraud, and the sale and supply of drugs and firearm offences. I don't think that was all one case, though. No, no. <laughs> um, she also has appeared in the High Court and the Court of appeal. But I looked her up on that thing called the internet, and this is only half the story. She was uh, in the Women and Diversity Law Awards uh, Woman of the Year finalist 2024. In the same awards, she was Advocate of the Year finalist 2024. 
in the same awards, <laughs> Diversity, Equality and Inclusion Champion of the Year finalist. In the year before that, Chambers UK Bar Awards, she was a Diversity and Inclusion Future Leader finalist. Do you know what? This list goes on for ages. I think just give her a round of applause. And she will tell you about criminal behaviour orders, quote, a purge on drill. Hello. Um, I was just sitting here looking and I realised that behaviour is spelt wrong. Um, that's quite upset me. Um, <laughs> um, can I just have a show of hands? How many lawyers are in the room? Okay, a fair amount. Um, for those of you who are not lawyers, um, this talk is going to be about um, what we in the profession call ancillary orders. So they often come either after a conviction or they are a standalone um, application that can be made outside of a, a criminal law context. Um, in relation to criminal behaviour orders, as I'll come on to, they have to follow a conviction, um, but these orders don't really form part of the trial process. But the reason that we're focusing on them for today's purposes is because I certainly have had, and I know that others in the room have, had um, lots and lots of cases where an application for a criminal behaviour order will be made to preclude and prohibit individuals making music. Um, and that can be either stopping them from performing certain songs that already exist, so the police will make an application and they will attach to the application a list of songs and they will say, you cannot perform these songs anymore. Or it will say, um, yes, you can make music, but you can't use these words. You can't reference these postcodes. You can't say these people's names. You can't talk about death or lacking um, or a number of other things. Um, but when these criminal behaviour orders were introduced, and they're fairly recent, um, I'm sure I'll be able to work out the exact date in a second, but um, they're not that old. When they were first announced and it was realised by individuals that they were going to be used to curtail people's ability to create music, um, Jody Ginsburg from the Index on Censorship um, put this quote out, and it always stuck with me, because she says, this isn't going to address the issues that lead to the creation of this kind of music, nor should, we, nor should we be creating a precedent in which certain forms of art, which include violent images or ideas, are banned. Um, and obviously that's a theme. I know you guys have um, all been talking about it earlier. I'm really sorry I missed this afternoon's session because I was in court, but um, I know that that would have been a theme that will run through everything that we're talking about today. Um, but effectively, in brief, this is the, 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 the history so uh, 20th of October 2014, so actually we will have had them for 10 years um, in this October. Um, and they effectively replaced ASBOs or antisocial um, behaviour orders. Um, and the key difference is really with the criminal behaviour order as compared to the ASBO was that the criminal behaviour order introduced mandatory requirements. Um, so that is requiring someone to do something, whereas the old ASBOs, they just stopped people doing, being able to do things. So they just said, you're not allowed to go to this place, you're not allowed to associate with this person. But the um, criminal behaviour order, you can now have a positive requirement on an individual. So that would be things like, um, you must register your mobile phone with the police. Um, you must notify the police if you create any music. Um, etc. Um, and the other difference, um, the other key difference between an ASBO and a CBO was that the test for whether or not a criminal behaviour order could be imposed went to helpfulness. So previously, when it was an antisocial behaviour order, um, the court would look at the application and they would have to decide if the order was necessary. What they did with CBOs was they watered that down and the test became the helpfulness test. Um, so that was quite problematic. Um, this is just a, a slightly technical summary, but again, here's the power to, to, to make the order. Um, and these are the um, criteria. So this section applies when a person is convicted of an offence. So it's not a standalone application. Um, and there must be two conditions that are met. 
And so the first, the court is satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that the offender has engaged in behaviour that caused or was likely to cause harassment, alarm or distress to any person. And the second condition, as I say, is that the court considers that the order will help prevent the offender from engaging in such behaviour. Um, and, what, and what's interesting about these conditions is that um, sometimes, certainly what I've found, is that an individual might be convicted of, I don't know, say a drugs offence, where it's not necessarily the case that on the facts of that offence there's antisocial behaviour that's been demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt. But because there's been a conviction for drugs, the police will then um, bring in a lot of other, um, I want to say evidence, but it's not evidence in the traditional sense that we lawyers understand. It might be hearsay statements, it might be um, an entry on a, on, on a police computer, for example, about other um, behaviour that they say demonstrates that, that, that someone's behaved in a, in a way that would likely cause harassment, alarm or distress. So it doesn't actually have to be the case that the conviction is for antisocial behaviour. Um, but if you have a client who is convicted of anything, that means that the trigger for making the application is met. And then as long as they can evidence the antisocial behaviour in other ways, they'll likely get over the threshold. Um, oh, here we go, some general principles. Um, so as I've just said, must be attached to a, a, a conviction on application from the prosecution. So it's not something that the court can just say, let's impose a criminal behaviour order. Um, there are certain cases where, even if there has been a conviction, you couldn't apply for a criminal behaviour order. So um, where a bind over or an absolute discharge is imposed. Um, the courts have made clear, and I'll, I'll run through it shortly, um, the importance of complying with the criminal procedure rules, and effectively that is that these applications have to be made in writing, in good time, um, and it's not just um, a rubber stamp exercise, there are actual procedural requirements that have to be complied with. Um, the court can decide whether or not to impose a criminal behaviour order after the sentence has taken place, but the application must be made before the sentence. Um, and as I sort of alluded to, the admissibility of the evidence that relates to the criminal behaviour order application differs from criminal proceedings. So criminal practitioners in here will know that when it comes to um, bad character evidence or, or hearsay <coughs> evidence, there's lots of um, hurdles that the prosecution will have to jump over in order to put that material before the court. Those rules don't apply for a criminal behaviour order, so you could have someone saying, oh, yeah, my friend's auntie's sister's brother said X, Y, and Z, and, and the court will still hear that. Um, breaching a criminal behaviour order is a criminal offence, so although the order is, as I say, a sort of an ancillary order, um, if one of the conditions is, is broken, then you can receive um, six months in prison. Um, and then just at the bottom, some examples of some standard requirements. So I think I've mentioned them already. Non-association, so not being able to hang around with people you may well have gone to school with for years and years. Exclusion zone, so not being able to go within a particular postcode. And then restrictions on use of social media um, <coughs> and possibly possessions of mobile phones. Um, this is just some, some case law, and I, I had a look today before I came about as to whether there had been any recent updates to the case law, and I haven't seen very many at all, and I don't know if that's just because we as lawyers aren't, aren't taking these points and aren't appealing them, if clients don't really want to, but um, it, it's been quite slow to develop over the years. Um, but basically, Brown and Morgan just established that the court doesn't need to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that making the order would help in preventing the offender from engaging in such behaviour. So again, it's a helpfulness test, but it's a low threshold to, to meet that helpfulness test, not the same as the criminal law that I'm certainly familiar with. Um, case of Bulmer established that all of the old case law that we have developed over the years that relates to the ASBOs applies to criminal behaviour orders as well. Um, I'm just going to whiz through these because they're not that interesting. Um, but Khan um, just established the importance of complying with the criminal procedure rules. 
um, and the case of Burness established that the terms of the order must be precise and capable of being understood by the offender. Um, and then, effectively, it Khan went on, and there was some helpful, helpful comments in the case of Khan, uh, particularly paragraph 20, when they say, we do not believe that it was the intention of Parliament that criminal behaviour orders should become a matter of mere box-ticking routine. As Beats and LJ said, such orders are not likely to be imposed. The court should proceed with a proper degree of caution. The order must be tailored to the specific circumstances of the person on whom it is to be imposed, and assessments of proportionality are intensely fact-sensitive. So something a little bit helpful in a very gloomy um, situation. So obviously this is back in 2018 where the orders really are still quite new. Um, and then again, um, just a slightly more um, recent case, um, well, a, a couple of recent cases actually. Um, the last one being, as a matter of principle, prohibition should not be imposed in relation to conduct which would constitute a criminal offence on its own merits. And I think that probably relates to, I don't know if you guys did talk about this earlier, but obviously when you're looking at music lyrics and what um, it, it is being said, Often the prosecution case will be, well, that's inciting another crime, but if it's inciting another crime, then charge it as incitement. Don't subject someone to a, a, a criminal behaviour order a, a, effectively, because as they said in um, Michael Roger Brain, if putting out that music would constitute a criminal offence, then a person shouldn't be precluded from doing it as part of an ancillary order to constitute a criminal offence. So there's certainly been a muddying of the waters as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is just a slide um, about the first criminal behaviour order that was imposed in relation, as far as I'm aware, in relation to um, drill music. So we're back in June 2018. There were five defendants who were all part of um, the 1011 music group um, and I believe at the time, Reese Herbert, aka Digger D, was part of that group as well. And if any of you have seen the documentary Defending Digger D, the order that he's talking about is this order. Um, so some of the um, requirements or prohibitions, non-association um, with members of that particular music group and others, um, unless it was for the purpose of recording or performing music. And if that was the case, then they had to get permission from the police. Um, the order included prohibitions on what could and could not be said on social media or as part of any song. So again, they were unable to make reference to particular individuals, postcodes, and um, one example, they weren't allowed to say the Harrow Road. Um, <laughs> um, they, there was an outright restriction on performing seven um, specified songs, and the, the police and the prosecution said that those lyrics were said to incite or encourage violence. There was an outright ban on them attending Notting Hill Carnival. Um, and there was also a positive requirement that they um, notify the police of the release of any new official music video in which they featured. So really like quite draconian restrictions um, on, on these um, young men who, yes, had been convicted of conspiracy to commit violent disorder, but were obviously individuals who had a passion for and an interest in making music. And effectively, this order, um, I think, just it, it enabled the police to, to, to monitor them above and beyond what they were already doing. Um, I put this slide on, I've done this talk before, and I put this slide on because at the time when I was thinking about this, um, Katie Hopkins was it, was, it was at a time when she was on Twitter and she was pu putting all of these horrific things um, online. So... So the 10-11 example that, that I gave you, just for a little bit of context, there was the murder of someone called T. Wiz um, back in 2017. The 10-11 boys were not suspects in that case. They hadn't been charged with, with anything that related to that case. But they released a song called Play for the Pagans. Um, and one of the lyrics was, T. Wiz got splashed and died, and I don't feel sorry for his mum. And it was on that basis that part of the criminal behaviour order application was, was made against them. And again, I just find it abhorrent, to be quite honest, that young people engaging in commentary on their life or things that engage in their life 
are having their art used against them in this way or having restrictions put on their art. Um, especially when you compare it to you know, what Katie Hopkins was saying, I just put the quotes up there, she was saying dementia sufferers should not be blocking beds, what is the point of life when you no longer know you are living it? And then she suggested we should burn all the boats in North Africa just hours after 900 migrants drowned on the treacherous journey from Europe. And that was on her LBC radio show. Um, but I think for me, those examples really just show the different treatment and approach to young black boys versus middle class white women. Or well, it's not always middle class white women, it, it, it could be anyone. Um, but. I suppose the vilification and, as I said at the start, the purge on drill when it comes to a creative art form that is predominantly um, produced by, by black people. Um, and no one, I don't think anyone who represents people who produce and put out drill music, no one's trying to say that some of the comments are not unsavoury or some of the comments are not shocking. The reality is, is we all know that sometimes that's what sells. That's why Katie Hopkins put out those atrocious tweets. Probably, she probably didn't even, she probably didn't even agree with what she was saying, but she was just doing it to be controversial, just to get herself on the front page of the newspapers. Yet when young black boys do it um, as a means of, of expression or for, for, for whatever reason, perhaps they're trying to better themselves, perhaps they're trying to um, get out of the situation that they find themselves in, um, it's, it's, it's used against them. Um, and then just the last point that I'll make, and I've sort of alluded to it already, but it was a really helpful quote from um, Michael Roger Brain, and the court said it in that case, if lyrics are so violent that they can properly be said to incite violence, which would be the only reason for censorship, then individuals should be prosecuted for those crimes as prohibitions should not be imposed in relation to conduct which would constitute a criminal offence on its own merits. Um, so. That really was just the whiz through of um, the criminal behaviour order statutory framework. I'm sure there'll be time for questions um, at the end. But <coughs> effectively, I think that as practitioners, we are frequently getting applications for criminal behaviour orders that sometimes we just roll over to. Um, I, I mean, I don't, but I certainly hear colleagues talking um, talking about it. And I know that Audrey's going to talk about um, expert evidence, but I've got a criminal behaviour order case ongoing at the minute. And I, our expert, Francis, has done like a 90 page report. Um, we are going all in on it because even though some of the conditions aren't that onerous, ultimately it's a restriction on someone's freedom after they've left the court. They've been sentenced. Um, they're going to serve either a period of time in prison or they're going to be on a community order or doing unpaid work. And these orders are ancillary. They're in addition to a punishment that someone's already got. Um, and it's a huge problem and I think the idea that it's just something that we should just roll over and rubber stamp and allow to happen um, is, is really quite problematic. So I'm not going to do that. I don't do that. But, um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions later about um, criminal behaviour orders and I'm sure these guys have got other examples too. And uh, let me just get the next load of slides up. Well, that was difficult. Um, big round of applause again, yes, please, uh, for uh, Danielle. And it, it is worrying, it is worrying, isn't it, um, in terms of uh, the very, very low threshold for these uh, CBOs. And maybe the constant theme uh, through today is for all of us to fight. Uh, lawyers obviously in court, if you happen to be a judge, uh, fight on the right side. And if you aren't directly involved in the court process, fight in an outside court. And for the recording, I don't mean that physically. Uh, next up is Audrey Cheryl Mogan, who wasn't here at the start. Um, she has an outrageous uh, explanation, which involves being in court and then rushing um, here. Um, so we're very grateful that she did do that. 
Um, again, there's an introduction that's been uh, written for me. I'm going to read it out, but I'm going to add to it because there's a load more stuff that should be said about um, Audrey, including putting up with me um, during the preparation of uh, an appeal on another Manchester case. Um, and uh, I think there's another barrister in here who also puts up with me. Uh, yeah, I can hear him laughing uh, over there. I think crying, in actual fact. Um, uh, but we'll talk about that on another day. Right, most importantly, Audrey, Barrister, Garden Court Chambers, practising in criminal law and related areas of civil liberty. She has particular expertise defending victims of modern slavery, children and protesters, and was named Legal Aid Newcomer of the Year in 2021. But that's not it. I looked her up on the internet. Here's some quotes. She has killer strategy. She is very good at what she does. Audrey has refused to lose. She has not conceded defeat, and I've never seen such determination. And on it goes, and she hasn't written these. Other people have written them about her because she is a fantastic lawyer, and I have the greatest pleasure of introducing her to speak to you about expert evidence in rap and drill. Thank you, Pierre. Much, much too kind, and I'm really sorry um, that I was late. I was running here from Luton. Um, okay, so I don't have a lot of slides because I find slides a bit boring. Um, but so crochet. <laughs> um, I thought this is probably so. This is um, a quote. Uh, from uh, the paper that I've quoted, uh, that I've cited uh, underneath. And I think it really underpins really what I'm going to talk about in my presentation. Uh, my presentation's on expert evidence. But effectively, um, what Shahrazad and Tony Ward are saying is um, we've been cowards as lawyers. Um, we're not doing enough to challenge um, the evidence that keeps coming up uh, in front of us. We're not doing enough to instruct our own experts um, to do that work. Uh, um, and yeah, so I, I really like this uh, quote and I'm just gonna keep that up for most of my presentation. Um, so art, drill, rap, really what I'm gonna talk about. Um, obviously purposely, purposefully provocative, um, both in terms of its lyrics and in terms of even, um, you know, pictures and visually, that's, that, that underscores that type of art. Um, the more provocative, the more people listen to it, the more likes, views that you get. Um, and of course, music industry being an incredibly difficult um, place to get into, and especially nowadays, social media being huge, being able to put that kind of stuff online doesn't cost anything. Um, but being able to get those likes, you need to be provocative, you need to be interesting. Um, and that's what will bring the big guys coming. You, you, know, you can't just walk into somebody's room in New York and say, hey, Jay-Z, give me a contract, right? Um, sorry, I'm gonna show my age that I said Jay-Z, but anyway. Um, yeah, but that's, that's the case. Um, but what we see time and time again as um, criminal barristers is how much that that's being used, that artistic form of expression being used um, in criminal trials um, and used with lifelong career police officers uh, purporting to be able to um, interpret what it is these young boys who come from a completely different <coughs> world than these police officers, career police officers, that's what we get. This isn't some, you know, this isn't independent um, expert evidence that we get from police officers. Every time you see a police officer, you ask them what they've been doing for the last 40 years. They've been in the police, now they're a consultant expert. Um, and that's the perspective that they're coming from. And it is a shame that more lawyers aren't challenging the independence of that evidence. That's what the criminal practice directions ask of us. And I do actually have another slide here. Um, uh, you know, look, experts duty to the court all that kind of stuff. We've got the criminal practice directions. Um, 
I can give you guys links to that if you care about it. But the fact is, you're supposed to be impartial, independent, um, and not be skewed. But what we always see is they're coming from a perspective of police officers. I'm in a drugs case right now. The police officers effectively just said, yeah, well, it's a drugs case. So I've been looking at these words, what young people, you know, 17, 18 year old people have been using from that context. Well, no, sorry, that's not what an expert's supposed to do. Just because somebody's charged with drugs offenses, you come at it. And we're, we're having a full day argument about what ting means. Is it a firearm? Is it drugs? Does it mean women? Ting. This is, this is what is holding up the criminal justice system. Um, but that's because we, as lawyers, um, aren't doing enough to really bring in um, the kind of experts that would be able to speak to this, experts who haven't spent their whole lives being paid by the police. Um, and, you know, of course, if you're in the industry or you work with young people or you're young and, or you listen to this music, um, you'll know, you know, you'll know the symbolism, you'll understand that it's exaggeration for effect. Um, but most of the people, obviously not people like here, but most of the people we're in front of in their robes don't come from that background. Um, and so I think it's really important that we are, um, as um, said here, um, that we are fighting against the so-called experts that come from the Crown. Um, and also, in addition to that, trying to rely on our own experts. Because what we see is it's never, oh well, here's some drill music by itself. It's almost always intertwined with a gang narrative, you know. I mean, I don't remember, I mean, again, God showing my age, but staying in the police and Neil Diamond, when they say dubious things about young women um, and what you could do with young women, um, you know, nobody's suggesting they're pedophiles or anybody that listens to their music is pedophiles. Um, but every time we get drill and rap coming up in front of us, oh, well, obviously you said this thing about a stabbing or you said this thing about a firearm. This is evidence that you're uh, a gang member as opposed to this just being um, artistic expression um, and it's not just and from our experience and I know any any criminal uh, practitioners in the room will know this it's not just if you write these lyrics um, it's if you have these lyrics on your phone um, it's if you watch these videos if you've appeared in one of these videos so it's not just when it's your own artistic expression but even the supporting of this artistic expression um, can lead you to be called a gang member um, in court so it's um, it's really problematic. I was doing some research for this and I saw something by Kieran Thapper um, a while ago. He does a lot of youth work and was talking about, of course, youth clubs barely exist, don't even exist anymore, cuts from the government. And some of the work that was being done in youth clubs to allow young boys to express themselves um, through these lyrics and, you know, get out their emotions, get out their feelings through making this music, um, only for that which is an incredibly positive thing, a, a way to be, you know, a, a positive expression um, and a, you know, a positive outlet for their creativity and their emotions, only to then be turned around on them. Um, and I, uh, as some of you might know, I could talk about this forever, but in things like joint <coughs> enterprise and conspiracy and group kind of um, uh, offending. So uh, it's this what should be and what is used um, by a lot of organizations and what he was talking about is the work that he does with young people um, to get out to have this positive outlet um, can then be used against you which is highly highly problematic um, so what I say is it uh, we need to be doing the work to put it in its proper context um, there is a case it's actually a case about modern slavery and human trafficking which I do a lot of work on AD um, but it's really important case I would say for what it says about experts um, in, <laughs> um, but I, I think this Danielle just said it's the worst case ever but it is helpful in some aspects um, to challenge when the crown are relying on a you know a lifelong police officer um, to decode what a 16 year old boy has said um, in some lyrics uh, again, expert evidence is admissible if it's relevant to a matter and issue in the proceedings, um, if the witness is competent to give that opinion, um, and it's needed to provide the court with information outside the court's own knowledge. Um, and But then it goes on to say it's necessary to follow the provisions of Part 19 of the Criminal Procedure Rules. Um, and, you know, 
that's what um, Sharzad and Tony are talking about here. Um, when they say, you know, expert evidence, and they're talking about gangs, obviously, but like I said, there is, you know, this intersectional um, thing between gangs and drill and rap music. Um, but really to be looking at what I've already said is the underlying features of where, what's the methodology here? How did this person, who's like, what, 48, 50 years old, a white guy in the police, how have they, what's the methodolo methodology that they've come up with to say that they can decode what these <laughs> words mean um, and put it in its proper context? They won't have it because they just don't. They're just put forward. Um, and unfortunately, um, a, a lot of the criminal bar just walks blindly through it. Not me, as Danielle says. Not me. <laughs> not me. Uh, and I'm sure uh, no one sitting on this panel. But um, unfortunately, it happens all too often. Now, the flip side of that coin, uh, I will say, is also what you see in AAD is a paragraph where it says, you know, expert evidence may be relevant to the questions that arise, and in that they were talking about the Modern Slavery Act, but they say, which are outside the knowledge of the jury, particularly to provide context of a cultural nature. Um, their whole thing is about not straying into issues that need to be decided by the jury. Um, but what they go on to say is in the right case, that evidence might include expert evidence of societal and contextual factors outside the ordinary experience of the jury. And I think we need to be fighting more to say that what 15, 16 year olds are saying is so far, and, and 15, 16 year olds, let's be honest, black boys mostly, black and brown boys, and you get a jury of like, you know, white pensioners, we should be able to argue that this is outside, that context is outside of their experience. Um, and again, I think we need to be using some of the case law that says this to challenge that. So the flip side of the coin is I'd say we should, in addition to challenging the expert evidence that's coming in from the Crown, we should also be looking um, to instruct our own experts um, in quite a wide uh, uh, array of um, areas. Some of the key cases, again, if people want to talk, it's a sunny day outside, I'm not going to sit here and go through all the case law with you. We could talk about it after, but things like Bonifin, about the idea of um, an expert um, should have in, in experience in the area of knowledge or human experience that would be able to form a sound judgment on the matter. Sorry. Whether the subject matter of the opinion is such that someone without help, um, could they form uh, a sound judgment on the matter without the assistance uh, of a, a witness possessing special knowledge? And again, I would say um, that lyrics and putting it into the context is something that needs that. Um, and that what you need to be an expert is a body of knowledge or experience which is sufficiently organized or recognized to be reliable. Um, unless we start fighting to say, these people, people like, I know we've used Frank Renato in the past, you know, people who do this work, who understand um, uh, this music, this, we need to be fighting more to say that this is a, a, an area that um, can be relied on because look at their methodology, compare that to what a police officer um, is doing. Um, and I guess some of the areas that I would say um, are kind of interesting to think about um, is and calling your own experts obviously we're talking about drill and rap music and stuff here but also things like music industry experts I mean how many times do we see it's all over my case right now people flossing tons of money in their hands can't even tell sometimes that stuff looks so fake so obvious or like watches and things like that and that being used to suggest oh put that together with music obviously this is gang gang related obviously this is um, uh, drugs related um, but again somebody to come and say well no actually that's what young people do um, that's how young people act that's how they engage on social media that's um, you know if you're trying to build yourself up as a musician as you know trying to get noticed by the big dogs in the music industry that's the kind of stuff that you have to do. If you want to get other young people to follow you, obviously you're not going to be sitting around in your one bedroom apartment. No, you want to show yourself off as having lots of stuff. And that's that context that that doesn't necessarily, you can't just make that leap automatically to involvement in gangs and, uh, um, uh, and criminality. 
Um, something else I've been talking to the Innocence Project about, and it's like own race and other race bias, which is kind of an interesting thing because sometimes you see, well, like I said, you know, you don't have to be the one that wrote the lyrics for the music. Um, you could simply be in a video. Then there's questions about, is that actually the person in the video? Getting police officers to come and say, oh, I recognize that boy. You know, there's, there's stuff under PACE, and there's a lot of case law about identification. But unfortunately, I think too often, again, that kind of material just goes before the jury. Oh, it's a police officer. He can say he recognized them. Um, when now, I mean, I know even things, and Owen's going to talk about uh, Article 10 and 11, but even when it's, you know, the European <laughs> Convention on Human Rights and, you know, in domestic legislation, um, judges will roll their eyes at you. So talking about things like own race and other race bias and trying to push for these other kind of reports, um, you're going to be met with a lot of friction, of course. But that's the point. You've got to not be a coward about it, and you've got to be putting that forward. Um, so the Innocence Project is doing a lot of work on that. I tried to, they sent me this really good article, but it was very scientific. I was trying to pull something out of that that might be, uh, that, you know, might translate um, into something. But one, they're talking about the U.S., but they said among 375 DNA exonerations in the U.S., 69% were related to errors in eyewitness identification. Now, yeah, again, in our domestic law, we've got things to look at um, in the issues around identification, but this isn't just about identification. It's about identifying someone of a different race that you're not particularly used to being around or you're used to seeing them um, in a certain context and what that might mean for the, the weight that should be placed on your identification. So, again, you're going to get eye rolls, obviously. Um, judges don't like this stuff. Um, but um, I think it's something th to think about. Um, uh, a colleague, F.A. Thompson, runs a charity called BLAM, and they've been doing a lot of stuff about Black British English um, and how that, you know, experts on that can um, actually provide better context to what young people mean when they're um, saying what they say. Other stuff is, ah, um, a good thing, people running away from police officers, always used as obviously you're guilty because you're running away. Well, what about experts who say, well, actually, if you've grown up your entire life with a terrible kind of relationship with police officers, of course you're gonna run. Like, of course you're gonna think that they're gonna do something terrible to you, and that is not necessarily indicative of guilt. And there are people out there, psychologists, that do this work that talk about kind of the racial um, trauma. That's what it is, is racial trauma of this kind of long um, interaction, negative interaction with the police. And again, putting that kind of stuff um, into its proper context. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of really all I wanted to say. Um, challenge uh, what the police have to say and then on the other side, try to get your own experts in. Yeah, I'm sure we can talk about this in, uh, later. And, and, and just to, to very briefly add to that, um, any uh, barrister who is over the age of about 25, uh, if confronted with a case that involves kids, shouldn't know what they get up to. Right? And if they do, something going on. Um, but on a serious level, um, anyone, as certainly as they get older and have any little letters after their name, if they really think they understand youth culture, yeah, they shouldn't be doing the job. They should immediately, in these cases, that have music, have lyrics, have issues of communication, get an expert. I only recently understood the young people don't talk to each other anymore. <laughs> they send these voice note things. Okay, now I've now adopted that in my relationship. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, moving on, moving on to Owen Greenhall. Uh, he's going to come and he's going to. Well, he's here now, isn't he? Uh, speak to us about rap crime, uh, contempt, and Article Ten, freedom of speech little description about Owen. Uh, you can see maybe the way he's smiling slightly to my right, that he's the type of barrister who would be at Garden Court Chambers. 
He's got a broad practice covering criminal law and related issues and areas of civil liberties. He's got a specific interest in protest law and the right to freedom of expression and has acted in many of the leading cases in recent years. But that really isn't enough a relation to Owen. I looked him up on the internet. This is what it says. A rising star of the bar and a clear silk of the future. He is fearless in court and has an intelligence that is frightening. <laughs> that was uh, in 2022. I don't know what his intelligence is likely. Now, uh, here it is. He is highly intelligent, has an excellent strategic mind and is well liked by clients. He is also passionate about his cause. One more. Owen Greenhall is a safe pair of hands with a wide range of legal knowledge across civil, criminal and human rights law. So here he is. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't put your slide up. Do you want me to do that? Uh, I don't think you are able to... Yeah, you just, just talk to them for a while. I will start talking. Thank you, Keir, for that introduction. Um, don't believe everything you read online. <laughs> I'm going to talk about... Uh, Rappers as crime. So this isn't rap being used as evidence to establish some other crime, but this is when rap and the content of rap is being criminalised uh, itself. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in the context of speech offences um, and also look at the interrelationship between the criminal law, um, human rights and injunctions. And I'm going to um, consider because... Rap is not actually often prosecuted using the criminal law itself. It's very rare to have a particular crime that performing a particular rap was a crime. As we've heard, criminal behaviour orders, injunctions, other means have been used to prohibit the actual performance of, of rap music. And I'm going to ask, why is that? And is that right? Is that balance right? And does it say something about what's going on uh, underneath? Um, as uh, Danielle said, uh, we, criminal behaviour orders have been used in the past to um, prohibit the performance of certain rap songs. Um, injunctions have also been used in, in the same way, and many of the issues are, are very similar. Um, what were uh, gang injunctions and what are now um, under the uh, Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act uh, injunctions have been used to prevent um, mentioning certain lyrics, performing, performing certain songs. Um, it was a few years ago that um, the drill artists Skengdo and AM were um, subject to an injunction that prohibited them from performing a particular song. They went on to perform that song. They were found in breach of that injunction and they were sentenced to a, a suspended committal order. All of this discussion, for the purposes of my talk, is going to be framed within the context of, um, of Article 10 of the European Convention. Audrey's right, I'm just going to talk about Article 10. I, I won't talk about Article 11, but I will also mention Article 14. So Article 10 uh, protects freedom of expression. It is the right to receive and impart ideas. It clearly covers music and, and expression in music. It clearly covers um, the performance of rap songs. There is, a broad, in broad terms, a hierarchy of speech for the purposes of the European Convention. Usually uh, political speech is at the top, and then uh, closely followed by that, we have artistic expression, then uh, commercial speech, so adverts on TV, and then moving down. And, and, and the, what, what is at the top has the highest uh, degree of protection, and the degree of protection reduces as you go down. So after commercial speech, uh, pornography, hate speech considered much have much less uh, level of protection. But rap music, obviously, it's artistic expression. Um, it may also, in many con uh, contexts, uh, constitute political commentary. So it is obviously going to be something which should receive a high degree of protection. The scope of Article 10 covers um, ideas which shock and offend, as um, Lord Justice Sedley said in, in the case of Redmond Bate, the freedom to speak only inoffensively is not really a freedom that's worth having, particularly if what counts as offensive and inoffensive is decided by a judge. So the fact that 
rap music may contain ideas which shock, which may, to some people, seem, seem offensive, that doesn't remove it from the protection of Article 10. Article 10 is, however, a qualified right, um, and it's always necessary to balance the rights of freedom of expression against the rights of others, and, uh, you, importantly, the uh, intrusions on the rights of uh, freedom of expression can be justified in, on the basis of the need to prevent disorder and crime. And that will usually be the, the countervailing factor which, uh, which is at play um, in, an, in an Article 10 free speech case. Um, that's what I want to say about the scope of Article 10, but it's important not to, uh, not to lose sight of Article 14, which is the prohibition on discrimination. So um, Article 14 requires that the rights under the Convention are equally protected across all protected characteristics. And it's very clear that, that both race and age are uh, protected characteristics for the purpose of Article 14, and uh, those are definitely matters that are um, in play in relation to the protection to rap music. So in terms of um, speech offences and the, in the context of a criminal trial, um, the first case I want to go to is the case of uh, Ziegler and DPP, and this is a Supreme Court case in 21. And it, was, it arose from the, in the context of a, of a protest um, obstructing the highway. But what it said, what's important is what it said about the need in the criminal process to justify the interference with the right of freedom of expression at all stages. So both arrest, prosecution, conviction and sentence are all restrictions on the right to freedom of expression and they must each be justified. So it may be proportionate to, in, the pro in a process context, arrest someone but disproportionate to prosecute them. It may be proportionate to prosecute them but disproportionate to convict them. It may be proportionate to convict them but disproportionate to sentence them to X number of years in prison. Or whatever. So at each stage there are different considerations in play. And looking at the consideration in the criminal process, which was, is focused on, on conviction primarily, what the Supreme Court said in Ziegler, which is the, the provision that's caused the most um, consternation amongst criminal practice practitioners, is that in a criminal case, the prosecution has the burden of proving to the criminal standard all the facts which it relies on to establish that the interference with Articles 10 and here 11, as freedom of assembly, that the, the interference with those rights was proportionate. And if the facts are established, then a judge, as in that case, which was a magistrate's court case, or a jury, should evaluate the facts to determine whether or not they are sure that the interference was proportionate. <laughs> Translating that into non lawyer <coughs> speak, what, what that means is, if you have a criminal prosecution where the right to freedom of expression is engaged, and that would clearly be the case if, if someone was being prosecuted for performing a rap song, it's the burden of proof is on the prosecution to prove to the criminal standard that it is proportionate to convict someone for this act, that it is a proportionate interfer interference with the rights uh, of freedom of expression to criminalise that act. And that that is something which is a fact-sensitive decision. And in the context of a jury trial, that is something that the jury have to determine. And, and this was the, uh, the basis of, in the Colston statute case, which I'm sure people are familiar with, uh, the jury were asked to assess whether the toppling of that statue and the conviction for criminal damage was, was a proportionate interference with the right to freedom of expression. Now, that was how things were set out in, in, in Ziegler. In uh, the Colson statute case, um, the protesters were acquitted on the basis that uh, a conviction was, was a disproportionate interference with their rights. There was then an appeal on, on the point of law, and the Court of Appeal rode back a little bit from the case of Ziegler. And the, the Court of Appeal basically said, there are some cases, some offences, where you can rely on this proportionality defence, and there's some type of, of offences where you can't. And they said some offences, like murder, um, where obviously it's a violent offence, if you're proved to have killed someone, you have committed a violent act, you're not acting in self-defence, 
community violent, violent act, that's not a peaceful protest in any way. That's not even in the scope of Article 10. So there's no, re no way of running a, 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 a this type of defence to that. And that would apply to violent disorder or any, any other violent offence. Um, and they said, on the other hand, there are other types of offences where there is a, a statutory defence of reasonable excuse. And in those types of offences, if on the facts Article 10 is engaged, if it's a protest, if it's an artist, artistic expression, on, in those kind of offences, that's where the court has to make an assessment of proportionality. Roughly speaking, that's what the Colston Statute case said. And there have been subsequent decisions. There was a, a case in the Supreme Court, the abortion services case, uh, Attorney General's reference to Northern Ireland. There was a case in the High Court, um, the Crown Deep on the uh, application of DPP in Manchester Magistrates Court, which have further refined these categories. But it, the Manchester Magistrates Court is, is one that's worth just considering briefly because th that was a case where um, at what was alleged was someone had followed the, the Tory MP Ian Duncan Smith out of the Tory party conference in Manchester and had been chanting Tory scum, Tory scum after him as he went down the road. And they had been prosecuted for a, a harassment offence. And they were acquitted in the magistrate's court on the basis that that was obviously um, political speech. And then the DPP appealed against that acquittal. And the High Court set out in quite robust terms that, that um, you know, when you have those types of cases where it's clear that the right of freedom of expression is, um, is engaged and you're being, you're being prosecuted for what you have said, then the court has to make an assessment of in the specific factual circumstances there is of whether or not it's proportionate to convict someone for that. And that is basically the position for all speech offences. And, and that was in the context of the magistrate's court. There was a, a recent case in the Crown Court, uh, which was, again, a harassment type of case, a, a grossly offensive communication case. And the, uh, the Lady Chief Justice set out guidance for Crown Court judges to consider when they're dealing with these sorts of speech offences in the criminal trials. And the uh, Lady Chief says, without aiming to dictate the precise terms the jury should have been directed to, um, the following points need to be made. The jury should have been directed that the law protects freedom of speech because it's part of living in a free and democratic society. Whether a communication is so grossly offensive that it amounts to a criminal offence and loses the protection of freedom of speech depends on its content, the context in which it was sent, and the purpose of the sender. And you can see that, I mean, that's quite a very general statement. Okay, that was a, a, a grossly offensive communication offence, but you can adapt that to really any speech offence and, and say it's all going to come down to the content, the context in which the speech occurs, and the purposes behind it. So that sets out the framework for the criminal law for prosecuting speech act offences in the context of, of the Human Rights Act. Then I want to turn and just consider a point that actually Danielle mentioned, because she made the point that it's often said, if, if we have, if there are concerns being raised by the police about particular rap lyrics, that they are, it's usually that they are inciting violence in some way. That, well, if that is a criminal offence, then it should be prosecuted as a criminal offence. Don't use a criminal behaviour order or some other civil injunction to try to prohibit that. If it's, if it's a criminal offence there, then that's what should, should happen. But that's not what happens. We don't see criminal offence, criminal prosecution being brought. And it's, it's worth just looking at why that is, because there is a statutory offence encouraging the commission of offences. There's, um, in fact, a, a, a sort of suite of different offences under the Serious Crime Act 2007. They're all broadly the same, and, and effectively, if, if you do an act which is capable of encouraging others to commit offences in the belief that those offences will be committed, then you have committed a criminal offence. And so Parliament has legislated for this particular 
area, they have said, okay, this is, this is a criminal offence. But importantly, the Serious Crime Act has a defence, has a statute of defence, a defence of acting reasonably. So essentially, you, if you are charged with encouraging others to commit an offence, you can, in your defence, say, well, no, it was reasonable. What I did was reasonable. And when we look at the criminal law surrounding speech act offences, we know that what that means is there's a reasonable excuse defence, so the prosecution are going to have to prove that the interference with freedom of expression is proportionate. So this is how the criminal law deals with matters. And if you were being prosecuted in the, under the criminal law, it would be a, a fact-sensitive assessment of proportionality, so that you would be looking at a particular performance of a particular rap song and ask it, was that performance reasonable? Was that justified? Is it, or, or in fact, is it justified to criminalise someone for that? So it's the burden on the, on the prosecution to prove that the interference is justified. And that just isn't happening. And if you look at why we have this reasonable excuse defence in the Serious Crime Act, the purpose of it, which was it, the, it was introduced, or the law, there was a law commission report which gave rise to the act. The purpose of this defence was to protect journalists, effectively. That, that if there was a film crew, for example, filming a riot and that was put on at the news, there was a concern, well, would that encourage other people to join in with what was going on? So it was, this was to protect journalists from commenting on current events. But there's no reason why you should restrict that to mainstream media. There's no reason why other forms of expression shouldn't rely on that defence. There's no reason why this defence shouldn't be available to people who are commenting on events of concern in their community. There's absolutely no reason why someone who performs a rap song which comments about events which have actually happened shouldn't rely on this defence. So looking at the criminal law, you can see there's going to be serious difficulties in bringing a prosecution for people who are performing rap songs. So that may give some insight as to why the police and the state have not chosen to bring criminal prosecutions but have used other means to, to try to restrict this sort of um, music. And as Danielle said, they, you know, there's been um, criminal behaviour behavior orders have been used. Um, there is also a power in the Antisocial Behaviour Crime and Policing Act to um, apply for a freestanding injunction. It can be applied for in the youth court for people under 18, in the high court or county court for an adult. Um, there are only specific people, well, organisations that have the power to apply for these orders, so it has to be either the police, local authority or, or a housing provider. Um, there is a duty for youths to um, consult with the youth offending team before any application is made. <coughs> and in broad terms, there's two conditions that must be satisfied before the court can make such an, an injunction. The first is that on the balance of probabilities, so a lower standard than the criminal standard, the respondent has engaged in or threatens to engage in antisocial behaviour. And the second condition, that it is just and convenient to grant the injunction for the purpose of preventing the respondent from engaging in antisocial behaviour. The first thing that should be noticed from those two conditions is there's no need for any unlawful act to actually have been committed by a person subject to one of these orders. You don't have to have committed a crime before they can apply for, for, for one of these injunctions. Threatening to engage in antisocial behaviour <coughs> isn't a crime. It's not even a tort. This is a freestanding power that the courts are given to try to clamp down on, on things that the courts think should not happen in some vague sense. It's, a po it's possible to apply for these sorts of injunctions without notice. There is, are real difficulties in getting legal aid to defend these kinds of proceedings, and they are legally complicated proceedings. And 
simply having this power, having the ability to apply, even if the court doesn't act ultimately make an order, it will have a chilling effect on people because being dragged into the process of having to try to justify the threat that this might happen, even if it's discontinued at an early stage, is going to be something that will put people off expressing themselves in the way that they want to in the future. But the ultimate point is that if the police are saying a rap song is inciting violence, what they are basically trying to say is it's a criminal offence. So they're trying to bring an injunction to support the criminal law, knowing that they will never actually succeed with a criminal prosecution. And the case law on injunctions in support of the criminal law is actually quite well set out now, and it, it goes back to the old Sunday trading cases. So this was uh, cases where it was, there were pr prohibitions on shops trading on a Sunday, and uh, those prohibitions were generally set by the local authority using bylaws. So there were very low-level fines with a maximum penalties that could be imposed. And shops like B&Q realised very quickly that if they opened on a Sunday, they could sell so much stuff on a Sunday and make so much profit that paying off any bylaw just didn't matter. They'd pay whatever fines. So the fines weren't effective. So then the local authority sought to get injunctions to prohi prohibit the, the shops from opening on a Sunday. And the court has to grapple with this case of, you know, you have an, an injunction which effectively prohibits what is already prohibited under, under the criminal law. And the case always, you know, there's no absolute prohibition on making that kind of an injunction. Is that no one's saying that it, it can't be done at all. But in general, it's discouraged, as Danielle pointed out, the, the, the relevant cases. And also, one basic pro proposition is that if you're going to seek an injunction in aid of the criminal law, you at least should try to use the criminal law first. But there hasn't been any attempt to engage with the criminal law to try to deal with these issues by the police in this area. They haven't even bothered. They just leapt straight to looking for injunctions and criminal behaviour orders. And that, in, I think, is at the heart of one of the problems with what's going on. Because by taking the focus off particular acts, by not saying, well, we'll prosecute you for that and see if we can get a prosecution, they are dealing with things at, at a, level, a higher level of generality. And it's much easier for them to present a prejudicial and inaccurate picture to a, to a judge in the county court who's not going to be engaged with these issues and will have a general fear of, of what's going on. And, and then you end up in, in uh, creating an order which, if it's breached, will lead to people receiving essentially criminal sanctions and then a, a cycle of engagement with, with, um, with the process. And, and it should just be cut off from the start. That's what I wanted to say. So I think, yes, from what Owen has um, told us, you can see how the dots join up and makes it even more worrying when you look at criminal behaviour orders and maybe why they're being used because the actual criminal offence itself cannot be proved. It's an impossibility. But it makes it more worrying that the CBO is um, used um, as a way of silencing um, rap artists, uh, artists themselves, and people who are in the <coughs> videos. Uh, just so you know where we're going, got 16 minutes left. Uh, two or three of those will involve me, and then the rest, <coughs> you, uh, asking questions of this uh, fantastic uh, panel. Uh, th first 30 seconds from me, uh, relate to another Manchester case. You would hope after 2017 things would get better in Manchester, but they didn't. They got worse, if that's possible, after prosecuting 12 people for one murder. When I say people, young, black, 
youngsters. Uh, 2017, uh, the Telegram case, Manchester 10, should never have happened. Conspiracy to murder, conspiracy to commit grievous bodily harm. One of those people I was supposed to meet, Ade Adideji. I was supposed to meet him and say, well done uh, for getting an unconditional offer to study at Birmingham as a law student. Slightly jealous of him, because that never happened to me. But instead of that, he was prosecuted in this trial, the Telegram 10, along with nine others. Vast majority of good character. And it's a long story. But within that prosecution, drill was at the forefront, in the middle, and at the end. And it shouldn't have been. It should have been fought hard. It should have been excluded by the judge. But that didn't happen. And fast forward, just because we have limited time. This is what the prosecution KC said at the end, uh, including reference to um, Ade. Quote, the last four defendants appear to have become involved in this gang culture, perhaps more on the periphery than the others, but for a number of different reasons. This is what is said, 2022, by Prosecution KC. Because of the area in which they lived. Because they had an interest in drill rap with its themes of violence, drugs. You can hear how it's going to be said to that jury. With the themes of violence, drugs and criminality that we have heard about. And that jury did hear about it beginning, middle and end. What an abhor abhorrent thing to uh, say about these young lads, and in particular in relation to drill rap music. And so that brings us neatly, I hope, to the bill that Art Not Evidence proposes. It seems to, I imagine, all of you now that we, well, you didn't even need some of this, I imagine, but there's been an education this afternoon that we clearly need a culture shift within the criminal justice system. Massive culture shift. And a recognition, an acknowledgement that being a black rapper doesn't mean you're a criminal. Full stop. Why do I even need to say that? That's how bad it is. We need a culture shift that acknowledges that rapping, writing lyrics, appearing in a rap or drill video, or just possessing it. Remember what that judge said in 2017, just possessing a rap video was sufficient. We need an acknowledgement that long list isn't bad character as us lawyers talk about. It isn't reprehensible behaviour. It's art. So it's a big job. But it's been started. Nadia Whitome, who you heard at the beginning addressing you, um, long-term goal is to see this bill, the Creative and Artistic Expression Bill, introduced into law and to raise the threshold for the admissibility of rap as evidence in criminal trials. And, and it's just so reasonable. I'm almost embarrassed to say it. It's not radical. It's reasonable. And just to uh, go through, you can see it on the screen there. Um, the starting point, again, reasonable, is that music, rap, lyrics, artistry is inadmissible unless the party that wishes to put it before the court uh, can prove um, to the criminal standard so that you are sure beyond reasonable doubt and then you've got a number of uh, categories there so you look that it's literal so it's not fictional which music tends to be 
It refers to specific facts of the crime alleged, so not general uh, references in the lyrics. It's relevant to an issue in dispute, and it's necessary insofar as it cannot be proven by other evidence, like old-fashioned stuff, like witnesses, or CCTV, or cell site. And then there's another long list there in terms of what the judge should consider. I'm not going to read through it all because it's right in front of you. But in considering these other factors, these other elements, the judge would have the assistance of an independent expert. So not a police officer, a proper expert that would actually assist the judge in considering this arm. And it's believed that if that is done, then we will have less rap music in criminal trials. And again, that shouldn't be radical. We shouldn't even be having this meeting to try and work out whether uh, rap should be featuring in trials in 2024. There will be a reasonable outcome as a result of this. The prejudice to the prosecution is non-existent because in the vast majority of cases this evidence shouldn't be going before a jury. So how do we bring that about? Visit now as I'm speaking. Come on. <laughs> the artnotevidence.org website. Do it now on those phones. You've been doing other stuff. I've been watching. Yes, nervous laughter from the right-hand side. Um, lobby your MP. You might think it's not worth it, but have a go. Some of them, not many, but some of them um, will uh, respond. They'll respond positively, and that will increase uh, the chances of getting this legislation passed. Follow us on social media. Uh, do all those voice note things or whatever young people do uh, that I know nothing about. Spread the word. If you are a lawyer, please fill in the survey. It's there right in front of you, available, um, and it will take two minutes, maybe even less, to fill in. And that's going to be useful in terms of the campaign going forward.